I want to I want to talk about my recent trip to Mexico. Mexico is very close to my heart, and I always had a strong feeling for the Mexican people, even when I was a, a little kid. It is a connection there that I just I talk about it in my in the book on the in the in the, uh, one of the one of the chapters is right on Mexico. When, when I think of art that influenced me, I think of a lot of pre-Columbian art that the uh, from the Olmecs to the Toltecs to the Mayans to the to the Aztecs and others. And it's just for me, I never tire of looking at that and never tire about talking about it. But one of the examples that I I. Uh, also, I keep in my mind the violent history of Mexico and Mexico's history of violence, and not not just from outside people, but within themselves. And that's, but that that pain that they've gone through, that many of the people of Mexico have gone through, and the uh, the depth the depth of their soul, for it, the artistic vision that came, come, comes out of that soul, that comes out of that being in difficult times and being in, in good times and looking for some bigger answer in, in, in uh, some kind of uh, God that is a God of the, that takes people's lives into a, uh, into kind of a command that that makes it a history of a authoritarian gods uh, and the Spanish and all of the combination of people like the Europeans that came and the uh, it's that mixture of this of the uh, the the European and the indigenous work in breeding together unlike in America in North America where the uh, indigenous people were, I, were were isolated and put on reservations you did have you have you have a lot of indigenous villages in Mexico as you have uh, in the anthropology museum upstairs the ethnographic section is a very strong section and it's something that I got to wheel around in a wheelchair and and uh, and uh, Alex, my cousin Lorraine's net, uh, oldest grandson, uh, and I we took the trip together because he's studying pre-Columbian art in college. What we're doing uh, when, we're, when, you, when you're going through that ethnographic section is the ethnographic section tells the story of the indigenous people. And not, this is not people that have built big monuments or anything. These are just people who still live in thatched huts and uh, live in the weary rural areas of Mexico, unpaved roads and things like that. Mexico has the second to India, the most in, uh, indigenous languages. There's 146 languages spoken in Mexico. One of them is Spanish. To understand that is to understand the influence uh, artistically and uh, of both the Spanish influence and the indigenous people's influence and the influences of the pre of pre-Columbian art and the major major uh, pieces of pre-Columbian art, the giant Olmec heads, the uh, the pyramids outside of uh, Mexico City. The, uh, the kind of big Mayan uh, like places like Palenque and things that really speak of a, 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 a very high high uh, high thinking and yet sometimes very brutal uh, combinations dealing with uh, for example the Mayans had a, a calendar only two days different than ours. And, and yet, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, 
the kind of fighting that went on with the Mayans was thought to be not as brutal as the uh, Aztecs. The Aztecs were, were brutal, and uh, and many indigenous people wanted to get rid of the Aztecs, so they, they those, those indigenous groups gang, uh, hooked up with the Spanish to get rid of the Aztecs. But hundreds of years before, in the Mayan civilizations, the, the various Mayan kingdoms were separated from each other and ended up fighting each other over, over territories that today we would consider uh, uh, not, not uh, as important as, as uh, looking at a, a larger space in the jungle settings because the jungle settings were so difficult to do a lot of things in, but they built beautiful uh, sculptures and uh, temples and all that in, in, in a very difficult the terrain. I want to talk about uh, the influence of the Mexican muralists in the 1920s and 30s and 40s that had a big influence on my art. As one of my art, major part of my art is, my, is the mural. And it's the mural traditions of Mexico that go back, go back to uh, pre-Columbian murals in the, in the temples and things. Uh, what, what we're really looking at when we look at that Mexican mural tradition is because of they were, it was financed by the government at first. And uh, Sconcellus, the, uh, who was the director of the education and the arts and all, uh, in the 1920s decided that he wanted artists to be involved in murals. It was very important. So when Rivera came back from Europe where he was doing, and the uh, Mexican revolution was over, and he came back, he was he, uh, from Europe in the night, early to 1920s, he was ready to do the murals and joined in in this massive mural movement led by him and uh, Orozco and David Alfaro Siqueiros. We're, uh, the woman that became the most famous of the women artists was Frida Kahlo, Diego Rivera's twice wife. And, uh, and she lived in the, her father's house and uh, in a bright blue house that they made that is now a museum. But unfortunately, and she was, a, she was an avid communist, she and Rivera had brought, got Trotsky, saved his life, brought him to Mexico and through Veracruz. But Mr. and, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Trotsky, as uh, someone might call them, uh, they, they stayed in Rivera's house, whereupon Trotsky had an affair with Frida Kahlo. But when it, then he moved to a place in, in Coyoacan, which is the oldest village in Mexico, where, where, the, uh, where the blue house is uh, of, of, the, of Kahlo's childhood. Uh, he, he was killed and I had a chance, uh, Alex and I had a chance to go and we did to try the new Trotsky Museum, which is beautifully done and how he was killed there. He was shot at, but that didn't kill him. It was an ax. He was hit, he was chopped with an ax. And uh, he was, uh, Trotsky was a favorite of the uh, intellectuals, uh, left left intellectual set like Rivera or Frida Kahlo. And uh, uh, Stalin had, had uh, gotten rid of Trotsky. Trotsky was the head of the, the Red Army, the Red Army versus the White Army. And Trotsky was the head of the Red Army and, and got, uh, and beat the White Army, the White Russians. And that was, the, that was what, that's what brought the, uh, uh, communists really into power. Uh, the power uh, that uh, Lenin wanted Trot uh, Trotsky to, to take over from when he, after he was very sick and he knew he was going to die soon. He wanted Trotsky, but Stalin out was more brutal and outdid Trotsky. But Trotsky was a, a terrific organizer and organized the Red Army. 
what we're really looking at in, the, in this history of Mexico is a history like that. It, there's, there's a violent ends to things. And it's had a very peaceful time to grow and to grow and to and more, be more prosperous than it, than it had been. And we're seeing in Mexico City many more skyscrapers than I ever saw before and many cranes going up all over the place. And that's, and that's one thing it says, it talks about corporate prosperity, is it doesn't reach the people. And uh, many times it does, and many times it doesn't. But they're really looking at, in the end, what's going, what, what, what artistically that's important to me is that the Mexican sense of color, that indigenous sense of color that's so incredibly beautiful and different and unique to, the, to, to Mexico. And the other is the, the history of violence and the painfulness of it. And that much of the art reflecting the pain and the violence and much of the art reflecting the beautiful color and the de decorative forces that are in the different indigenous weavings and text, other textiles. I have uh, some drawings I did in Mexico that I, uh, with my ink, uh, ink felt tip pens. And I'll just go through them. Thinking of the people kind of crunched together. Mexico City is a city of 30 million people. And now you say, well, why, why is it always say, in the, the early t uh, tour books say 24 million? Well, 24 million is down in the centro. That's not Mexico City. Mexico City is with the expansiveness is 30 million. So I this reflects that crowdedness. The kind of the kind of multiple aspect of the the Mexican mind, which is fascinating to me. The pulling in different directions, the indigenous and the, their history with the, uh, the very bad treatment of the indigenous people. And the kind of, the kind of uh, pain that goes through the countryside. The industrialization of Mexico and it's the second largest economy in Latin America. And sometimes it's the first, but mostly it's the second, Brazil, and then go back and forth. This is a quick sketch I did of these two boys, a, a little boy and, a, and his big brother. And it was, they were selling stuff when they should have, either they should have been in school or they, maybe the older one was in school, he had his uniform on. But the time of day was not, yeah, and all I could think of was they didn't get make bring home money. They were could get hurt. This kind of the, the massive, the massive uh, subway system that moves six million people at a time. But when you're in a city of 30 million, six million is a drop in the bucket. But they have this wonderful bus system that brings the, that these bus trains, accordion with the accordion in the middle, that allows them to to bring a lot of people to the to each of the metros uh, stops, and then they have the regular buses, and then they have these small bu buses that also go to the to the metro. This is a. This is talking about the the feeling of that of those giant Olmec heads, but also somebody screaming to get out down below here I, of the pain that they had to go through over the years. This goes back to the conversations. 
compositional devices and this is just two Mexican people talking to each other and one is one is talking in a complicated way and one is talking in a very simple direct way and that seems to be part of the conversations in Mexico seem to be partly that now because you have a whole group of people that are intellectuals that they always had but that but these highly educated people coming out of coming out of the university which is over 600,000 students in the daytime about 300,000 at night and the, the the plain talking simple talking average person in the This was just a guy, who, a young, a young boy who was very chubby, but was working in this uh, in the Mercado's rest, the giant Mercado, in central Mexico City, um, and he's working with this guy who was very thin, and the two of them looked like opposites, and they were, but they were both doing their jobs. These almost take on, the, the lines almost take on veins and the veins of ideas, the veins of pain and one side and the Spanish uh, on the other side. The large head is the, the ve with veins of pain and the other one uh, uh, not seeing the other one's pain. This is the uh, this is uh, 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 the Mexican men learning how to try to they're trying to figure out the, what is the role of women in their life and many of them are doing much better with it but there's many many times you could see them questioning. The, the new role for women. But what's possible is they may have a next president may be a woman. And they have many women in positions of power in Mexico City. Mexico City is full of a variety of people and the traditions of those people show up clear differences but for the most part, they are the Mexican mixed combination of the indigenous and the Spanish. This was a, a, the Spanish on the right side, and on the left side is the is the excitement, the growth of Mexico City, and talking back to the Spanish and saying we can we you know we can do this on our own, as the Jesuits told Father Hidalgo and uh, General Allende in San Miguel at the Jesuit College there in San Miguel de Allende. Who's listening? Who's talking? Who, who cares about what I said? Who cares about what you said? Always questioning. In the end, there is a growth happening and there's always a conflict, but there's a growth happening that comes out of these conversations, which can be very painful at times.
so painful that sometimes you may look, think it's going to blow your head off and there's a little dynamite stick up there. And again, the profile of the more Spanish, more European, and the other being the more indigenous. 20% 20, 20 of, of, of Mexicans are African descent. They were brought in as slaves from the Spanish when the Chichimecas in the, in the northern central part of Mexico and the, uh, and the people in Oaxaca down in the south central part of Mexico told the Spanish that they, didn't, they, had, they had no reason to, to listen to them and they weren't going to do anything they told them to do any work. So the Spanish brought in slaves from the Caribbean and that gave it another mixture in the uh, Mexican mix. And because Mexican means it's a mixed person. There's a kind of a flashy, sunglassy kind of guy there that uh, represents a very small group of Mexican people, but it's kind of, it kind of gets a, a, a way of the uh, gets typified in, in caricatures and stuff of some Mexican families. The other side is, is, is a fancy, overly fancy kind of a Castilian Spanish guy. Here we're seeing the confusion that, and the noise level and the thunderstorm outside is going on, but inside this is there's a, a, a chatter going on about what's happening and the other side just kind of looking the other way. So you have one chatter, a chattering class and one just looking the other way. Once again, we reconnect, but we reconnecting differently. And on the left side, a decorative, more complicated thoughts, and the other side is a simpler, more traditional thoughts. This reflecting the uh, the, the arrival of the Afro, we say Afro-Caribbean. I guess it was the what they read. And the uh, the more in the indigenous people on the left is the indigenous, on the right is the Afro. This is the last one. This is the the building of modern Mexico and the vast amounts of skyscrapers and cranes going up and, and the vast uh, industrialization in the middle of all that, that soul of the indigenous and the soul of this, the uh, mixture of the Spanish and the indigenous. And that, and that wedge that's driving through part of it and part of it looking to going forward. It's not, it's not an easy direction to go. In a country that is 15th in world economies, that's sixth in oil, that is first in silver, one of the top three in gold, um, copper, one of the top three in copper, and has many other material wealth that still really haven't got to you be, be fairly shared in, in the economy. But the modernization is there and Mexico City is an extremely complex city with a lot of things, a lot of changes going on in it that represent the changes of, of all of Latin America, but especially of, of Mexico. It is for me 
artistically that complex combination of the indigenous and the Spanish and that, that complex feeling of uh, aesthetically that you get when you mix up, again, you got a mix of lots of different cultures. And that's that combination that makes it unique in the art world.